TGO, Tom Grunewald Outdoors, is brought to you in part by HT Premium Ice Tackle, Polar Fire Gear. This is how it's done. Vexilar, ice fishing begins when you turn your Vexilar on. And Tourism Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan, Canada's best freshwater fishing. Hello everyone and welcome to Tom Grunewald Outdoors. I'm Tom Grunewald. You know we're in that classic transition period between midwinter and what a lot of people define as late ice. You can really feel it. The sun's starting to get just a little bit warmer. Temperatures are moderating. You can even hear birds up in the air here and sitting out in the trees in the morning. And I love fishing this time of year. It's a classic time to catch panfish in particular. The game fish season for your walleyes and pike is starting to come to a close on many waters. And the panfish bite really gets pretty good. It's a great time to go out and target those fish. One of my favorite things to do though, aside from the classic bluegill, crappie, and perch type thing, is to also take advantage of some of the opportunities we have for catching stock trout. And uh, you know, really there are three different options. You've got what's called a put and take fishery, which a lot of times trout, especially rainbow trout in particular, are stocked late fall after the water cools down, but before the ice forms, providing an opportunity for ice fishermen to catch fish at least seasonally. Another of course is your classic deep water spring fed cold water lakes. Support your rainbows, browns, brook trout, Obviously a better opportunity for catching bigger fish because it's not just a single season type fishery. But one of my favorite opportunities really is what's called a two-story lake. And what that is is that you've got a lake that's deep enough to support cold water fishery like trout. And at the same time, you've got enough shallow water area that the same lakes sustain a population of warm water fish too, such as largemouth bass or bluegills, that sort of thing. So what you can do is you can go out, look at lake maps, find areas where you know that the bluegills or the panfish probably spawn in the spring. It will happen late ice here. As we get later and later into the seasons, those fish will start to stage. And they'll sit right outside of those pre-spawn, cover-strown, shallow water, backwater areas, and they'll, they'll really concentrate there. So you can get out, work those weed lines, catch bluegills, catch crappies, catch perch, a lot of times a mixed bag. If there's forage there, the fish usually are too. And in addition, if you look for the deeper basins or deeper water areas adjoining those places, typically rainbow trout will occupy a little bit different ecological niche and they'll suspend out over the deeper water in those basins. So really, you can go out, you can catch those bluegills, maybe the crappies or perch, and with just a short move, you can be a little bit mobile and get out and add a couple of rainbow trout to the mix too. Tell you what, I love this kind of fishing. Weather's beautiful, fish should be biting. Let's go out, let's see what we can do here, see if we can catch a little bit of a late ice mixed bag on one of my favorite two-story lakes. Yeah, a little bump there to start. There's one hanging off at the bottom a little bit. Just nipped at it though. There we go. Woo! <laughs> Whoa, whoa, whoa. This one's putting up quite a tussle there. You got tangled up in my transducer cord. I've got just a really nice, super, super ultralight combo here that I'm using with a two pound test line. Ah, oh, largemouth bass. That's why we're fighting on there a little bit. That's the nice thing about this transition period here between mid-season and late ice is you just never know for sure what you're going to catch. And uh, boy, when that fish hit, he started really pulling it. Boy, it feels like a nice gill. But uh, look at that, largemouth bass. Not a big fish, but I'll tell you what, on this ultralight tackle, uh, it doesn't get too much more fun than that. Let this one go, that's a fun start right there. There we go, just always give the fish a second. There she goes. More fishing action online at tgofishing.com. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what I got here, but he sure made a couple of hard charging runs. Whoa. So what I'm doing here is I'm kind of palming this reel. I'm not really using a drag. You'll notice it's just kind of spinning. I'm using the thumb here just to put apply pressure to the spool. When they make a run, I just let them take the line out. 
and then more or less back reel it. So I can get by with using a really light rod. And even if I catch a bigger fish, I'm pretty sure to get them. Boy, look at this, got another bass. <laughs> that was fun. Almost a twin to that first one that we caught. Nice, nice. That's fun. I tell you what, these, these aren't big. That's probably only, uh, oh, maybe 10 or 11 inch bass. <laughs> but on that ultralight system and that light line, it just makes the battle all that much more fun. Boy, that's cool. And I just love this time of the year because you never know what you're going to catch. You get a nice mixed bag of different species. Let this one go, get a little bigger. Boy, that's a nice fish. It's a lot of, a lot of fun on that ultralight rod. Nice and easy. There, hey, that was a good start. You know, there's something I want to show you here. You know, a lot of people think about color when they select their lures, but they don't think about it so much with their bait. You know, in today's world, there's a lot of different types of uh, bait out there. And one of my favorite baits is a spike. And uh, spike, of course, are, they're usually kind of a, a cream color like this waxworm. But there are different colors available now. You can get these in yellow, red, blue. And I'll tell you what, sometimes the color makes a difference. And even better yet is to use a couple different colors at one time on your bait. So right here now I've got a red and a blue. And what I like to do with these, and I've got a very small number 16 epoxy trouble here. I like to take the worm and I'll just barely, just barely nip the hook right through the edge of that worm like this. Just let it hang there. Now you can watch, you can see that worm or that spike wiggling and moving on there. So I can actually hold this completely still in the water and just let that spike or that maggot wiggle like that. And that in itself is a perfect motion to attract panfish. Now I add uh, blue too. Now I'll tell you what, that makes a big difference sometimes. Um, a naturally colored uh, grub is great, but sometimes that extra little bit of color just makes all the difference when it comes to really being able to consistently catch fish. Now let's just see if I can get anything to come up. Again, this is red and blue. It's a combination. And I know there's a few fish there off of the bottom. There we go. Come on, boy. Not a big fish. I sure like transducer cords. For some reason, they're attracted to those the same way they're attracted to different colored spikes. But that didn't take very long. I've got a pretty good school of fish coming in right off of the bottom right now. And I tell you what, that fish just came right up there and, and just ate that, uh, that little jig. I've got a, a small Marmuska tungsten dancer. It's really been one of my go-to baits this year. The heavy weight of the tungsten body, it's kind of a bullet-shaped body. I'll show you that here. Let this thing, he's a small guy. Just let him go. This jig itself, just to its design, almost eliminates any spin. That tungsten body is loose on the wire there. And you can just see it hangs completely straight. You're not getting that, that rotation, that movement. A little bit of movement they're getting here right now is because the wind is is blowing it, it hangs completely straight. Does not twist, does not coil. And when you get on heavily fished populations of uh, panfish, if your jig starts spinning, it will definitely reduce the number of strikes you're going to get. And I've got another feature of the system I'm using today. I've got, obviously, I, with that lighter line, I want to use a lighter tipped, real light action rod. I also have a special reel on there, and I've got this touch series reel that uh, HT makes. And unlike a spinning type reel, where the line can be twisted or coiled as it comes on and off the spool, and in addition to, of course, when uh, you're pulling against a drag, which will put twist in a line too, with the single action fly reel, the line's coming straight off the reel, directly to the stripper guide. There's very little, if any, coiling, and line twist is minimized. Now, I've effectively increased the way that I can present this bait more effectively. I've eliminated that line spin, so even on a heavily pressured fishery like this, where fish can really be fussy, and if they see any kind of spin turn away, I've almost eliminated that problem. I'm increasing my effectiveness, I have better presentation, and I'm gonna catch more fish. There we go. Whoa. Mm -hmm. 
This feels a little more solid again. Oh yeah. Wow. Here we go. Whoa. What do we got here? I haven't seen them. Oh, unbelievable. You won't believe this. Talk about multi-species. <laughs> I don't think I've ever done this before, folks. It's a sucker. Again, fish came up off of the bottom and hit, and that was actually quite a fight. I think this is the first for me as an ice fisherman. But, you know, again, as we're getting toward this late ice season, you're going to see a lot of different kinds of fish getting more active and moving around. And I was really thinking, the way it was fighting, it wasn't fighting like a bass. I almost thought it was going to be a trout. You just never know for sure what you're going to catch. Wow, that was cool. He actually fought. And I, 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 I cannot remember a time where I caught a sucker through the ice before. <laughs> wow, is that weird. But again, we're working on it right on the edge of this, uh, this pre-spawn uh, these pre-spawn fish right on the edge of the spawning bay and that's fed by a little feeder creek and of course suckers run up that uh, to spawn themselves so they must be kind of staging down there too and i managed to get lucky and actually catch one that is so cool you're watching tgo tom grunewald outdoors Hey, you know, anytime that you're out ice fishing, you're always looking for a variety of structures, features, and different forms of cover that are going to attract and draw fish. And, you know, your common things would be a variety of different types of weeds. You might find stumps, downed wood, and that sort of thing. But a lot of people overlook man-made cover as an option. And one really good form of man-made cover that will draw a lot of fish in the wintertime is a fish crib. And I'm not sure how many of you are actually familiar with what these are, but I've got a local panfish expert and member of a fishing club here that's been working very hard um, over the last three years, putting in some fish cribs on a local lake. And I've got Brian Ebert here with me. And Brian, you guys have been working on these now for what, three? Three, three four years. years. Okay. Yeah. Our permit from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources was actually uh, 25 permits, or 25 cribs within a three year period. Uh, we actually have right now, we have 15 cribs in the water and we have 10 above the ice right now, ready to go down. Okay, and now there are certain regulations you need to follow when you're constructing these, uh, correct? I mean, yep. as far as dimensions, depth, things like that? Yep, the, the requirements of the DNR, they require you to have at least 15 feet of water over top of the cribs, and also the size requirements are eight by eight by eight. We make ours out of all biodegradable material, which the DNR requires you. Mm -hmm. Ours are made out of ironwood and we use cinder blocks to put on the bottom to carry them to the bottom and then we use rebar on the corners to hold them together and then we fill them with pine trees and then put half logs on the bottom and the top to lock everything together so nothing can come out. Okay, so eight by eight by eight and then there is a requirement as far as the, the depth that these are placed. Obviously in place, you can't locate them for instance next to a swimming beach or you have to, you know, make sure that they're down far enough that even if the water's low, they wouldn't have uh, trouble with boat traffic striking them. What kind of regulations are there involving uh, depth and location? They, we try to, you actually have to have a, the permission of the landowner, which is called the Rapidorian Zone. In front of them, you have to have actually a permission from them put, to put them out and then you have to be at least 100 yards off of a swimming facility, any kind of swimming area. Um, the only other thing they have is you have to have 15 feet of water in case a skier or something comes through and that make sure that they don't hit the top of it. And basically construction is you got the ironwood logs and then your Christmas trees placed on the inside. And obviously once this is sunk, this is going to draw plankton, which draws bait fish and then attracts the, the game fish. Well, what species have you found primarily are being attracted to the cribs? In the wintertime, it's usually uh, bluegills and crappies come to them. Um, some are small, some are big, but it, they kind of just form right, they kind of climb right inside the whole crib just for protection and stuff. Mm -hmm. If you can get them out into the, into the the panfish out into the deeper water faster where the zooplankton is, their, their chances of growing faster are better. And it's been working really well here in Long Lake. Well, it's going to be interesting to see the data on that the longer that these are in the water and just kind of see, because obviously you're monitoring that sort of thing. 
Um, also, no question, there must be some kind of regulation regarding location as far as the, the bottom. Like, you can't put this on a drop-off because obviously that would fall. Even when you place these on the ice and they sink, they're not going to go straight down. They're gonna, there's going to be some movement. Right. So what, what kind of regulations are there as far as the um, bottom structure and the drop-off, uh, bottom content, that sort of thing? As far as the, you can't have them on more of them than a four-foot slope. Um, because otherwise they'll, they'll roll and they'll move. And when the ice does go off, they actually do move uh, 15, 20 feet at least from where the GPS coordinates where you have them on the ice because the ice shifts you know, as, it, as it goes and when they fall through, they might move a little bit. Sure, sure, okay. And the, so you can't have much of a slope just because they have to sit. And then bottom content, is there anything as far as a soft versus a hard bottom? Obviously, if you had too much muck, these could sink quite a ways if they... The DNR requires you to do a, a muck test, and all we did when, with the fishing club is we put together a bunch of uh, pipes and we lowered it down and then found out it can't be more than a, a foot of muck on the bottom. You want them to sit flat, you don't want them to sink away. So there you go. Anytime you're out ice fishing, you're always looking for different structures and features that are going to attract fish. Don't just look at the natural ones, like your weeds and wood and things like that. Be sure to check out some man-made features as well. And fish cribs here would be a primary target. They do draw fish in the wintertime, and they're especially productive on lakes that don't have an abundance of the natural features you might otherwise be looking for. So be sure to check out the fish cribs. It may help you catch more fish this winter. And speaking of catching more fish this winter in man-made cover, let's go and see a different form of man-made cover that we used when we were fishing with Dennis Foster out in South Dakota. Now we're gonna try something here, it's a little different today. We're basically fishing this South Dakota slough and we've got this huge basin here um, that's basically featureless. There's really no structure, it's just kind of a dishpan shaped thing, drops down into maybe 15 or 18 feet of water. And uh, as the day gets along a little bit and that light drops, these schools of crappies will tend to move in, they'll kind of suspend maybe four or five feet off of the bottom through this basin. But without any structure or cover to really hold them, they're just moving through quickly, and you're picking off a couple of fish, and then you're waiting again for those schools to move back through. What we're gonna do is we're gonna use these items here that Dennis has, and uh, they're called real weeds. It basically looks like a plastic aquarium weed that you'd find in your aquarium at home, but uh, that's all on a cord, and there's a weight here at the base to help hold it down, and uh, we've got this, actually Dennis set it so that that weight will be suspended off of the bottom, maybe six to 12 inches, that will allow fish to actually get underneath the weeds if they want to. Or of course, they can relate to the weeds themselves suspended above the bottom. And we've actually got three holes on each side of our shelter and a couple out here in the front as well. And what that's going to allow us to do is basically create our own structure and cover all the way around the shelter in an area where there isn't otherwise any kind of a feature that might hold fish. So we'll give these a try, see if it works. Go fishing, tgofishing.com. There he is. All right. This one, he got a little bit of beef to him. I don't, it's not huge, but there's some weight there. Nice, nice. Man, fishing with these little systems is fun. <laughs> Again, keeping that rod tip high. And then I can lower down to the fish if he makes a strong run on me. Another bass. Not as big as the last guy, but boy, I'm telling you what, these fish have really moved into this area of actually catching more bass than I am bluegills, which is kind of a big surprise. But that's the beauty of fishing. At this time of the year, we got the transition between midwinter and late ice. And this is just a primary example of what's happening. These, these smaller male bass are moving up, and I would imagine they're setting up pre-spawn. They're staging just outside of these um, weed lines, these pre-spawn areas, and they're here pretty thick numbers, and they're biting pretty well. And that'll happen, and they'll just get more and more, they'll get more and more, and act, more active, and the fishing's just gonna get better as the season wears on, and we start to get this ice melting down. Uh, bass fishing can be tremendous um, at times during late ice when you get the right mild conditions like this. Boy, that's fun on light tackle. Hey, it's been a great day. We came out here expecting to catch a little bit of a mixed bag. We know in a two-story lake like this that we've got the bluegills, bass, and the normal warm water species 
probably starting to stage and set up pre-spawn just outside the weedy bay that we were on. And we know also being a two-story lake that there's a stocked population of rainbow trout in here. And it was my hope that I could get in, maybe get into some of those bass and bluegills up along the weed line, then move out over this deeper basin and find some rainbow trout. Now, normally those fish will be suspended anywhere from midway or halfway down to within a couple of feet up off of the bottom really never marked any suspended fish or anything that indicated the presence of rainbow trout. Obviously, they could be in a deeper uh, area of the lake, possibly in one of these other basins. Maybe they're even up along some other weed line, um, but they weren't in this particular area here today. So we didn't have any success with the trout like I'd hoped, but we really got into a surprising number of bass. Caught a few nice bluegills that are obviously just starting to move up into this area because they were very light colored. And we even caught a first for me a bonus sucker. Never know what we're gonna catch here on Tom Grunewald Outdoors, but we hope we'll catch you again next time. TGO has been brought to you in part by HT Premium Ice Tackle, Polar Fire Gear, this is how it's done, Vexilar, ice fishing begins when you turn your Vexilar on, and Tourism Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan, Canada's best freshwater fishing. TGO, where it's all ice fishing all the time. <laughs>